All right, good fruit. We got a, a new song, a good song. We got some good worship. We got a good message coming. It's a good day, isn't it? Come on, guys. It's a good day today. I'm excited. I hope that you are too. Yeah, it is gonna be a good day today. Um, We are starting a new series called Good Fruit. I even have my good man, Josiah, bringing me up a brand new little plant here. Can we give Josiah a hand? Thank you, Josiah. And man, he he killed it today, leading that same God. Same God is like one of my top worship songs right now. And Josiah, thank you for leading us in worship. I appreciate you, man. Um, All right, we are jumping off uh, today into a new series called Good Fruit. We're gonna start message number one today. It's called Vine Ripened. Vine Ripened. as we're gonna get into this message uh, in this series, it's gonna be four weeks. So even before we start, okay, you don't even know if it's gonna be good or not, I am asking you to commit to four weeks of this series. It's gonna be four weeks that really is going to help you in your relationship with God. And we wanna dive deep into a scripture passage that we're gonna start today and we're these four weeks spending on one passage that we're gonna cover, um, yes, a, a different parts of it each week, okay? It's not the same verse every single week. Um, but we want you to commit to that. Um, come back if you're here in person, if you're traveling. I know it's summer, people are traveling. Um, just commit to joining us online. You can subscribe on YouTube, even if you're online right now, checking us out for the first time. Commit to this four-week series. I don't care if you're not a Christian. Commit to this four-week series so at least you find out um, what we believe before you reject us. Um, so please um, commit to this four-week series. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Good fruit. <laughs> Okay, yeah, okay, we'll move on. Well, the game was on the line. It was overtime, and the clock was running out. The Buffalo Bills were playing the hated Pittsburgh Steelers. I say that not because I am a Bills fan, I just am a Broncos fan, so we hate the Steelers here. Sorry, if you're from Pittsburgh, we'll pray for you. (laughs) And the wide receiver, Stevie Johnson, was running into the end zone to catch the game-winning pass. And there he was, the quarterback threw him a perfect spiral pass that was coming into his hands, and as the football came into his hands, he dropped it. Does anybody remember this? And lost the game. Later that day, um, Stevie Johnson, the, the wide receiver, went on Twitter to express his frustration, and this is what he said. I praise you 24 seven. And this how you do me? You expect me to learn from this? How? I'll never forget this, ever. Thanks, though. (laughs) Don't you love that? Twitter just gets you, like, all the free expression, you know, like, this is what people are thinking. This is what he was feeling in that moment, and what is it that he's feeling in his relationship with God here? You guys sense it? He's mad. He's frustrated. He's angry because he had a transactional view of God. That if he praised God 24-7, if he served, if he did what he was supposed to, that God would reward him and bless him. He was thinking, if I do this for you, God, you gotta do this for me. It's a transaction. I'll give you this, you give me that. Quid pro quo. And that's not how God operates. Because if you view God that way, you will be frustrated and angry at times. Because God won't give you what you want. He'll give you what you need. (laughs) And so we need to to move beyond this. Some of you still have this view of God, and I think people the world over have this view of God. In almost every religion world over, it's like, I do this, I pray this, I I fast like this, I I give money to the poor, and if I do those things, then God will be good to me. Even if you don't have a view of God, you might be like, karma, you know, you do good and good things come back to you. Or the universe somehow will work everything out if I'm good. That's how people view it. It's all transactional. Thankfully, there's a better way, and it's the way of Jesus. Because God doesn't want a transaction. He wants a relationship. He wants a real relationship with you that is not transactional. Sure, you're gonna do stuff for him, but that's not the basis of what he wants. He's gonna do stuff for you, but that's not what it's about. It's a relationship. You know, I'm, I'm married to Melissa, and, and I'm, I'm gonna do stuff for her, right? But that is not why she married me, so I do stuff for her, right? There's the relationship that the core that's even more important, what it's all about, and God says, I want a relationship with you. And it is a beautiful, powerful thing to understand this and move beyond that childish view of God that is just transaction-oriented. 
So God doesn't want a transaction, he wants a relationship. And that's gonna be the, the ground of our entire series, but today we really are gonna dive down into what this means, this, this basics of this relationship. So if you're new, this is gonna be so core to, to what it means to follow Jesus. It's this relationship you can have with God. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, I think this, this message and this series is really gonna help you take a next step. As Sam talked about, just take that next step, even if it's a little baby step in your relationship with God. Because when you have a real relationship with God, not just transaction-based, it's going to produce good fruit in you and through you. You're gonna start to change from the inside out and you will be filled with life, filled with peace, filled with joy as that relationship continues to grow and that's what I want for you. I wanna help you in that aspect of your life because as you grow in a relationship with God, the good fruit will come out of that. So we're gonna be in John chapter 15 today and actually for the next four weeks. So if you have your Bible, open with me to John chapter 15. If you have a smartphone or you're online, get the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app. Um, on the bottom right-hand corner, it says more on your phone. And then right in the middle, there's an event button. You can find our Rise Church Denver event and you can save the notes, the scripture right on your app so you can have those with you wherever you go. And we're gonna be on John chapter 15, verses one through 17 for these next four weeks. Um, today, we're gonna look at verses one through four. And I wanna start off by reading this. This is one of Jesus' very last teachings that he gave his disciples and in turn us before he died. So it's really important to him that we understand God and the relationship he wants with us. So let's read together John 15, one through four. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. We're gonna talk about pruning next week. Verse three, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Verse four, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless You remain in me. So here is Jesus teaching, and this is so important as he's describing to us this relationship that we can have with God. And he uses, of course, the image of a vine, a vineyard. And on this one vine, there's a lot of little branches coming off. We are all the branches, every single one of us individually. And we're connected to the bigger vine. That's what he's saying, this relationship that's a connection that you can have. We don't have a vineyard in here, but we do have a nice little fruit tree, okay? And you can just imagine, even though it's not a vine, we have the trunk, and then off that trunk are a lot of branches, and yes, this tangerine tree doesn't quite have any fruit yet, does it? But these branches, as it continues to grow, will bear fruit someday, right? And that's what happens. There's a branch connected to the main vine, the main trunk, and from that connection, that relationship, all the fruit is produced. You guys understand what he's talking about here? Notice in verse four, he uses a word remain. He uses it four times just in that verse. And if you read through the verse 17, which I encourage you to do this week, he actually uses that one word 11 times, meaning it's kind of important, okay? He didn't just say it twice or three times, 11 times, the word remain. If you have an older translation of the Bible, it might say the word abide. I actually like that, ver- that word a lot. Because it's not just remaining, like staying connected. It's like living, abiding. It could be translated as dwelling or residing. It's the same kind of word that describes when God came in and his presence resided in the temple. Jesus is saying, abide, reside in relationship to me. Always connected. And that's what Jesus wants for us. And that's the relationship. This is not a transaction. It's not like do these things, if you serve, if you give, if you show up to church, then then I'll give you something good. It's like, no, 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 it's a relationship. It's supposed to stay connected and from that connection, the fruit is produced. It's from the relationship and that's so important. Have you guys ever had a relationship that you thought was gonna be one way and it turned out transactional? Maybe you've experienced this. You, see, you run into an old friend. You haven't seen them forever or they reach out to you on social media. You're like, oh, it'll be so great to get together. Let's grab dinner. You grab dinner and they're like, oh, here's some knives I'm selling. And it, you can sell them too and then I'll make money. 
You're like, oh, I thought this was gonna be friendship, and now it's turning into a multi-level marketing scheme, right? Okay. Have you ever had that happen to you? You know what I'm talking about? And there's nothing wrong about buying and selling between friends. But when you thought it was going to be relationship of one way and it turns transactional, it just leaves a sour taste in your mouth, doesn't it? You know, it doesn't feel good. How much more so if you went to a wedding and they're getting up to read the vows and the groom says, I vow that I will always fill up your gas if you do the dishes. How'd you feel at that wedding? Like, it's good that they wanna do things for you, but if, like, I'll do this for you, if you do that for me, that's not romantic. You'd be booing at that wedding, right? And you'd be walking out of that wedding, right? Because yes, you do things for each other in a relationship, but the basis of a marriage relationship is love and it's a covenant for life. It's not just transactional. And, and I do fill up the gas for Melissa. Just the other day she went and she's like, Matt, she had called me up. Can I say she hadn't filled up gas for 10 years. She's like, I forgot how to do it. Like, this is what happens, right? Because I, I fill up the gas for her. She does a lot of stuff for me. You do that in a relationship, but we don't do it so that we'll get the other thing. We're not, it's not a transactional thing. We do these things for each other out of love. I'm sure there's things I haven't done in 15 years, <laughs> like wash my own clothes. Um, right, we have these things that we do for each other, but it's not as a transaction, it's out of love because it's a relationship and that's what God wants. He doesn't want transaction, he wants a relationship to connect, to abide, to remain in him. And that's why today we're gonna learn from Jesus three different aspects of this relationship that are so important. Three different aspects. So if you're taking notes, get ready. These three different aspects that he points to that are so foundational to this relationship that Jesus wants with us. And if you want a good relationship with God, this is what it's going to take. And the first one, first aspect is our relationship with God is through Jesus. Our relationship with God is through Jesus. Some of you are like, well, duh. But for some of you, this is groundbreaking. If you want a relationship with the creator of the universe who holds and sustains all things, who gives everything life and breath, you need to know Jesus. And it's through Jesus you have that relationship with God. Jesus says as much in John 15, one. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. So just imagine that vineyard. The father is the vineyard keeper. He's gonna make sure things grow. He's gonna be the one that comes around and prunes as we'll talk about next week. But our relationship with God is being a connecting to the vine, to Jesus himself. The way we know our father in heaven is through Jesus. This is important. So this statement here, he says, I am the true vine, is actually the seventh and final I am statement of the gospel of John. He says things like, I'm the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. And here he has the last one. He says, I am the true vine. And this was a huge deal because in the Old Testament, so in all the scriptures that came before Jesus, over and over again, do you know who the, the vine was? Israel. God's people, the Jews that God had chosen and from those people that, that God would bless the rest of the world, it, it, it was the Jewish people, the Israelites who were the vine. In four different prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea, they all describe Israel as the vine. But Jesus changes it, doesn't he? He's saying, I am the true vine. I am the way to connect with God. You are not having a relationship with God because of the family you were born into or your nationality because you're part of a people group. No, no, no. It is a one-to-one -one relationship through Jesus to God. That's what he's saying here. And this is a bold assertion for a Jewish man to make. Jesus was, by the way. But he's saying, if you want to have a relationship with the Father in heaven, you have to come through me. He made it abundantly clear in the very previous chapter in John. So he'd already been teaching his disciples for a little while, and I want you to see this in John chapter 14, verse six. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other avenue. You can't go to another religion. You can't pray in a different way. If you wanna know God, the Father, you need to know me. And some of you are still like, well, are, are you sure? How does that work? Hey, that's exactly what the disciples did. Look what happens next. Verse eight, Philip said, one of the 12 disciples, he said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. We want a relationship with God. Show us that. Jesus is like, you still don't get it. And in verse nine, he says this, he answered, don't you know me, Philip? 
even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? They still didn't get it. Don't, that Jesus is saying that, I am the way to know what God is like. Have you ever wanted to know what God is like? What he looks like? I've been reading through a kid's Bible with the twins. They're three and a half now, Canaan and Evie. And we got to the very last story and it's telling about the new heavens and the new earth. It's like from the book of Revelation. And they have cool little you know, pictures in there, these graphics. So they always are looking at the pictures. And in that one, they were really intrigued because it talked about the new heavens and the new earth and they had this picture and there was a throne in heaven and there was a figure seated on the throne, but you couldn't see his face. You couldn't really make out even what the figure was like. They had purposely blurted out because if they actually showed a representation of God, that's breaking the second commandment, if you've never read the 10 commandments, okay. We have no image of God because God is spirit. No one has seen him. It's not until heaven that we will see what he is like and then we'll see him face to face. No one has seen God. So they were like, what? They, both of them asked me like, what does God look like? And they're looking so intently. They're like trying to maybe like smear off what's on the page because maybe then we can see God's face. And I was trying to explain to him, well, well, God is spirit. Nobody's seen him and we won't see him until heaven. But then, but I thought about it. I was like, God has shown us what he looks like. He sent his own son, Jesus Christ. In him, the fullness of deity dwells. He came from the father full of grace and truth. Jesus is the exact representation of God. If you want to know what God, whoa, we even got some ethereal music in there. I like that. That's kind of cool. <laughs> the angels are singing right now. <laughs> um, but here is, here is Jesus, and he is the exact representation of God. If you want to see God, see Jesus. If you want to know what God would like being and walking among us, see Jesus. Because he loves, he serves, he cares, he gives. He gives his entire life to die in your place. That's what God is like. If you don't want to know the Father in heaven, you've got to know Jesus. And it's through him that you have a relationship with our Father in heaven. And Jesus says that. I am the vine, you are the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. It's so critical. And when we come to him in that relationship, there actually is a transaction. I want to tell you this. There is a transaction. Because a lot of people, when they do come to God, they're like, okay, I messed up, so I got to clean up my act if I want to get right with God. I talk with people all the time, they're like, I can't come to church, I cuss too much, been sleeping around, been drinking too much. I'm like, I, I will be honest, I don't care if you're drunk right now, get to church. I, I really don't. Yeah, that, because it doesn't, you don't come to him or, or, or start doing good stuff for a few months. Like, if I have three weeks of sobriety, then I'll go to church. No, because the, the transaction that actually takes place is done all by God. And this is the second point. The initial transaction is not ours to pay. We do have to pay something, and guess what? Somebody else paid it all. What actually happens is that we come to him and we bring our worst stuff, our sin, our filth, our background, we bring all that junk, and God takes it and removes it away from us to start a relationship. This is interesting. In, in John 15, 3, Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Now that word clean, it doesn't seem to make sense in this passage. Is, aren't we talking about a vine and branches and fruit and all this, this metaphor of the vineyard? Why is clean in there? Well, it's actually because verse three is, we'll, we'll dive into next week a little bit deeper. The word prune could also be the word clean. You're cleaning off the bad branches, Right? So he says that, hey, the, the gardener's going to prune. He's going to clean up the tree, the vineyard, but you are already clean. This is important because just two chapters earlier, they were talking about sin and Jesus said, you are clean. Because to a Jewish person, it was a big deal whether something was clean or unclean. We talk about sin, but they would talk about something being unclean. In, in in Jewish religion, what Jesus would have grown up in, the disciples would have, there were certain foods that were clean and certain foods that were unclean. There were certain activities that were clean and then there were certain activities that were unclean, like don't touch a dead body or you'll be unclean. And you have to go to the priest and the priest has to declare you clean. 
before you can go around with other people again. There was a huge list of rules. Go read it in Leviticus if you want. (laughs) All these rules. And I just have to stop and say, I am very grateful that Jesus declared all foods clean, okay? Because now I can eat a bacon cheeseburger, bacon wrapped shrimp, that is two sins wrapped in one. Can we just give God some praise for that? Woo! I am grateful for that, okay? Jesus declared all food clean. But what he's saying is that when you know me, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. You don't need a priest anymore to declare you clean. You are forgiven. You are cleansed, and you can come to God right as you are. Isn't that amazing? And this isn't just like for a little while, and then you have to go back to the priest to declare you clean again. No, no, no. It's once for all time. Jesus' word is a declaration that you are clean. The judge has spoken. In our court of law, a judge will either say guilty or not guilty. Jesus is saying, I will declare you perfect, clean, Holy, and that declaration stands. Not just that your sins are removed from you by the blood of Jesus on the cross, but that you are declared good and right, and you can have a good relationship with God because you are declared clean. Do you understand that? That's the transaction. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to be good enough, serve enough, give enough money, and then maybe you'll be right with God. No, you are declared clean by Jesus himself. Because the real transaction happened on the cross. Jesus, the one perfect man who did everything right, who followed every rule and regulation, who served and loved and gave his life, was the one who died and was punished. The prophet Isaiah says it this way. The fact is, it was our suffering he took on himself. He bore our pain. But we thought that God was punishing him, that God was beating him for something he did, but... He was being punished for what we did. He was crushed because of our guilt. He took the punishment we deserved, and this brought us peace. We were healed because of his pain. That's the transaction. Martin Luther called this the the wonderful exchange, theologian. Because we give Jesus our worst, our bad stuff, our sin, our pain, our suffering. He took it all on the cross. And when we put our faith in him, he gives us all the good stuff he earned. He declares us forgiven. He gives us new life, a new relationship with God, peace in our hearts, joy unending. All of that is given to us. What an unfair transaction. Jesus gets all the bad stuff. We get all the good stuff. But that's what happens in the cross. That's the initial transaction. And it's even better than that. It's not just the one time when you come to faith. That's how it stays all the time. You don't owe God a tip. Everywhere you go nowadays, you gotta pay a tip, right? I don't care what it is, there's a tip. Um, Comedian John Christ had a a skit the other day on Instagram, on his reel, and um, it was weddings in 2023, and he was the priest officiating, or the pastor officiating the wedding, and after he declared him husband and wife, he turned his phone around to leave a tip. And it was like weddings in 2023, right? Can you zoom in on that, right? Isn't that everywhere you go, you gotta leave a tip. Good service, leave a tip. And you're like, oh my gosh, what'd you even do? Like, and then you feel obligated. If somebody's looking over your shoulder, you kind of hunch over, right? And then you don't want them to flip it around. Okay, everywhere you go nowadays, you gotta get a tip. Some people think that when they come to faith, like they, they, don't, they don't come because, oh, then what am I gonna owe God if he saves me? Guess what? You can't ever pay him back. You don't need to pay him back. You could never tip him enough for what he's done for you. He doesn't even expect you to. You are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is not by works so that no one can boast. That's it. You don't owe a thing. It's not transactional. The basis of your relationship with God is because he loves you. He has mercy for you and he wants you. He didn't even save you because of the good things you would do. He saved you because of his mercy and love. And that is such good news. Such good news. Because now I don't have to pay him back for the rest of my life, give enough. Oh, now God, look, he got me out of that mess. What do I owe him, right? No, you don't have to do it. But what happens is you begin to form this relationship with him. And as that relationship grows, you want to do things for him. This is how relationships work. And this is our third point, is that the relationship produces good fruit. 
It's from the relationship, from the abiding, from the connecting, from the remaining in relationship with him. And as that relationship grows, you want to change because you love him. You want to do certain things. You will become more generous. You will become more patient. You will become more likely to serve each other. You will be more likely to love your neighbor yourself. Why? Because the relationship is growing. And this is what we see in John 15, four. Jesus said, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. It's remaining in relationship, connecting, abiding, that produces the fruit. Think about it. If I cut off this branch, will it produce any tangerines? Some of you guys didn't even know that. Okay, I'm teaching you biology now, okay. <laughs> you, you get some fruit at the store. You're like, I don't know how it got here. It just like fell from heaven. If I cut off this branch, it will not produce fruit. Some of you got, buy, buy the tomato, like vine ripened tomatoes. Okay, they were, they were already on the vine before they cut it off, okay? It might help it ripen a little bit to stay connected to the vine. But in order to grow in the first place and produce fruit, it has to be connected. Because when it's connected to the vine, when it's connected to the trunk, then it's getting the, the good nutrients from the soil, that xylem and phloem and all that good stuff is, is bringing up the nutrients and it's creating buds. And then the buds produce blossoms and the blossoms produce fruit. But none of that happens if it's disconnected. If I cut off that branch, it will no longer produce fruit. But all that I have to do to produce fruit is connect it to the vine. Does that make sense? It's when staying in relationship and continuing in relationship that the fruit is produced in your life. And that's a big deal because that's how relationships work. With Melissa, I do a lot of things for her. She does a lot of things for me. I do more things today than I did when we first got married, right? And I enjoy spending time with her. It wasn't like we just got married and it was like, okay, good, now we can be roommates for the rest of our life. Do you know why I got married? Because I wanted to spend the rest of my life with my best friend, to hang out, to have fun together. And we still have fun together. We still have this relationship and we do more things for each other. We change. I hope I'm a different man than I was 14 years ago. Because when you're in a relationship with someone you love, you change and thing, good things are produced from it. That's what happens with our relationship with God. Do you know neuroscience is even proving this now? There's a neuroscientist who studied brains when people meditated and thought about a God of love, Andrew Newberg, neuroscientist. He would study people. And what he found is when people reflected and thought and meditated on a God that loved them, it would actually make the neural synapses in their brain stronger to have compassion for other people. The more they knew they were loved, the more likely they were to love other people. The more they felt God's compassion, they would have compassion with other people. The more that we're forgiven by God, we can go out and forgive other people. It's that love that literally is changing our brains. Science is proving it. Jesus knew that if you stay and remain in relationship, it will transform you from the inside out and you will produce good fruit in your life. It's not because you're working harder, but because God is working in you and through you to produce good fruit. So it's from that relationship that good fruit is produced in your life. Do you see how this isn't a transactional thing? It's a relational thing. And God doesn't want a transaction. He wants a relationship. And some of you don't even know what that's like. Maybe you've been even a follower of God for your whole life, follower of Jesus. Maybe you're new to this and, and you feel like, man, it still feels so transactional. I gotta do this and God's gotta do this for me. I don't wanna do this, but I guess I have to do it. Okay, but when you're in a real relationship, it begins to change you. And it's amazing what God develops in you. And I want you to experience that good fruit within you. There was a journalist a few years ago that traveled to the Ivory Coast. And he found that there were some cocoa farmers there that had grown cocoa beans their whole lives. It was their job. They, they worked hard. They had worked farming cocoa beans their whole life and had never tasted chocolate. So he went in there to give these cocoa farmers chocolate for the first time. And I want you guys to see this video up on the screen. Dans ma poche là, mm. vous voyez ça c'est du chocolat. Ouais. C'est avec ça qu'on ça partie de ce fève là qu'on qu fait ça. Ah bon, c'est du chocolat. Oui. Et pour goûter voir. Ah bon. Non, prenez ça pour vous, allez-y. C'est doux. Oh, c'est doux là. 
Vous aimez C'est vraiment intéressant. Mmh, Diaga Carola, ça, ça bat un truc. Ah bon On mange. Vous aimez ça Vraiment, vraiment, vraiment on aime. Mmh, C'est doux. Oh. 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 Hey. Oh. Il y a le tomba bon, nous va demander. C'est <rire> Isn't that amazing? They finally got to taste the fruit of their labor for so long. They didn't know that there was chocolate out of their hard work. And I'm telling you, our relationship with God, we can taste the chocolate, okay? And I want you to. I want you to taste the good fruit of the work. It's not we do these things for God in order for him to do stuff for us. It's in relationship with him that we will experience the fullness of joy, peace in our hearts, a relationship with God that just enlivens us and fills us with hope. And that's what I want for you. I want you to experience that. Just imagine what that could happen and change your life. But you don't feel obligated. I guess I have to go to church and be around these crazy weirdos. It's like, no, no, I want to go worship Jesus. I want to spend time reading God's word because it just fills me with this sense of hope and a connection with God. That's what I want for you. And I believe that God wants that with you too. Jesus is divine. You are the branches. Abide in him, remain in him. Because God doesn't want a transaction, he wants a relationship. So what's your next step? What's your next step? So what we always challenge people to do is to take their next step of faith. That's what following Jesus means. Whatever your next step is, take it. So if you're here today and you do not have a relationship with God through Jesus, maybe you kind of know a God that's out there, some nebulous form. No, 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 you need Jesus and you need to declare him as your Lord and Savior. So that is your next step. Because when you declare him your Lord and Savior, you are declared clean, you're forgiven, your sins are removed from you forever. You're given new hope, new life, and eternal life on the other side of death. That's all available just by accepting that gift. He's already did the transaction, you just have to receive it. So maybe that's your next step. And in a minute, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to say a prayer and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So that might be a step for somebody in here. Maybe for some of you, the step is to go public with your faith through baptism. Okay, we have a baptism planned in August, but we have one gal who's going to college before, who just accepted Christ, going to college before we can do our baptism in August. So I'm like, we're gonna dunk you. Like, they're not gonna let that stand in the way. So next week, we're gonna have a special baptism. We actually have two people that are signed up for that right now. But maybe you're here and you're saying, I need to go public with my faith. This is my relationship. I have to declare this to the world. That's what baptism does. So if that's you, go to ridesdenver.com slash baptism, fill out that form. We'll get you dunked next week. You're not ready next Sunday? That's okay, we got another one coming up in August, okay? Fill out the form anyways. That's your next step to grow in a relationship with God. But maybe for, a, for some of you, you've kind of gone, gone astray for a while. You've been meandering, you've fallen into sin, you, you've, you've done some stuff and you're even reluctant to come back. Maybe for you, the next step is just to come back into relationship. You are clean, you are loved, you're welcomed. The, pro the father is welcoming the prodigal with wide open arms, running out to give you a hug and welcome you home. So your next step is just to reconnect with the vine. And that's today what you need to do. Others of you though, you have a relationship and it's time to grow in that relationship. And how do you grow in a relationship? You spend more time together. You spend more time together. It's not more stuff that you need to do for God, but just be with him, grow in a relationship with him. So how could you do that in your life? Because let me tell you, if you have a branch that's only connected to the tree for one hour a week, it ain't gonna produce fruit, right? It's gotta stay connected, remain, abide. And that relationship shouldn't just be one hour a week. It should be all week long all day long, every day. So what's your next step to spend more time with God? Is it to just maybe start praying every morning, to start reading your Bible, maybe to read for a little bit longer, to, to pray for a little bit longer, 
Go from five minutes to seven minutes, okay? That's, that's a good step. Maybe you're like, hey, I've been doing that for a while. I got my daily quiet time going down um, that I've been reading my Bible and praying. But maybe my next step is to spend an hour with God in prayer once a week, okay? That's a big step, but that's going on a date, right? Do that to develop your relationship. Maybe it's even longer than that. I don't know, whatever your next step is, I want you to take it to grow in your relationship with God because as that relationship grows, you're gonna see the good fruit produced inside of you and through you. And, And that's my hope for the next four weeks. Let's focus on our relationship with God. We're gonna learn together every Sunday morning in this series. And you're gonna commit to this because you're gonna subscribe on YouTube, on your phone, even if you're out of town. And we're gonna grow in our relationship. But I want you to think about that one thing that God right now is putting on your heart, that step so that you can grow spending time and abiding with your Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, his son. Because when you remain in the vine, you'll produce fruit. It's from your source that good things will come. So I'm gonna close this out in prayer right now. And um, I'm gonna give an opportunity for anybody who needs to take that first step, like I said, to repeat this prayer after me so that you can declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, say this prayer out loud to give courage to somebody around you who needs to pray it for the first time. Let's pray together. Please repeat after me. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Save me, forgive me, make me clean. In faith, I declare that Jesus is Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me to follow you and abide in you for the rest of my life. Now with eyes closed, we just wanna celebrate anybody who made that decision for the first time. And we actually have a book Um, that I've written a little book that could help you with some next steps of faith for you. So if you made Jesus your Lord and Savior for the first time today, we hold your hand up on the count of three and and we're gonna come and bring you one of those books. So on the count of three, one, two, three, put your hand high in the air if you made that decision today for the first time. Put your hand in the air if you made that decision. And and if you're online, go to risedenver.com slash follow. We would love to hear from you and we'll send you this book digitally. Um, And Lord God, I just pray for... um, Every single one of us, I know in here, in this room, people watching online, there are people who are reconnecting with you. They've been away for a while. They messed up, they've strayed, but you love them. I pray that they would feel your love, experience it right now, that they would be welcomed back in the fold and they would just experience the joy that comes with a living relationship with their Father in heaven. For those of us today that realize I need to spend more time with you, God. I wanna grow that relationship. Lord God, would you give us the courage and the discipline to do that? That we would say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna block off everything else. This is so important. This is my most important thing. I've gotta spend that time with God. And Lord God, help us do that every single day, every single moment, so that as our relationship grows, more and more good fruit would be produced in us and through us. I pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.